Jesus is the joy of living. 56 in your hymn. Thank you. 
be seated. Um, I believe the men are supposed to come up and sing a song now. So if you're a guy and you know how to sing, go ahead and come on up. If you don't know how to sing and you want to just mouth the words, feel free. patient with us as we try to figure this out. But as we come to communion this morning, let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we do pray that as we uh, come to this communion table that our hearts would be right and our minds and uh, our spiritual minds and eyes would be, be open and receptive to the things of your word as we look at uh, communion and, and salvation. I pray that if there's a soul that needs to be saved, that today they'll put their faith in Christ. And for each one who has been saved, that their salvation will be much more precious to them and their Savior. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The practice and benefit of occasional review is well established. Um, I remember as I went through school, teachers would ever so often say, okay, let's have a review. I loved it, in, in Bible school especially, that they'd say, let's have a review before we have the test. Oh, do you do that, Sheila? Praise God for teachers who do that. I needed those reviews. What are the purposes of reviews? What do you do when you review? Well, you reconsider. You re-examine, you evaluate, you study the things that you've already gone over or already experienced. And when it comes to communion, you should review your salvation. This is a time of review for salvation. And we gain a few ways to review salvation from the passage we find in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 6 to 14. And I would ask you to stand as I read this portion of Scripture in honor of God and His Word. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die at peradventure. For a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, it says in the King James. It's the same word as reconciliation in the Greek. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. Thank you. You may be seated. The first thing that you need to do to review salvation and communion is to recall your need for salvation. Now, as you go to the last part of verse 6 and then also verse 8 in 12 to 14, you'll see this very clearly. Uh, and notice some words that you find in, in these verses. And, and the, the last part, that verse 6, Christ died for the ungodly. And in verse 8, we were yet sinners when Christ died for us. And verses 12 through 14 shows us that uh, we're all sinners as well. And all sinned, for all have sinned, verse 12. So you see that there is a problem here. You possess the guilt of sin in your natural state. And uh, verses 12 to 14 gives that idea. He says, sin entered into the world by one man and all have sinned. And he says, even if you haven't sinned the same sin as Adam, you're still guilty of sin. And we're even told in Psalm uh, 51, 5, the psalmist says, uh, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. You see, there's a problem whenever we're conceived and when we're born, and that is that uh, we, we get the nature that our parents give us. Uh, that's not all a problem. I'm glad that I got a human nature from my human parents. See, I didn't become an animal. Although there are some who are so twisted they think we're animals. But I didn't become a cow or some other kind of thing like that. I got a human nature from human parents. That's a good thing. Except for this. That nature is sinful. And you have the same problem. You've got a human nature, but sin came along with that nature. And so, you possess the guilt of sin in your natural state. And then we see, as we go to verse 6 and then 8 through 10 in the first part, that you prove incapable of self-help in, in, in your natural state. It tells us there, when we were yet without strength, that Christ died for the ungodly. That means that we're powerless to do anything morally or in any other way, in ability to do anything to help save ourselves from the sinful state. God commendeth or demonstrated his love toward us from while we were yet sinners. And, and uh, we, we see from these verses that uh, we're totally incapable because all sinners fail any righteous position before God. We're sinners before God. We stand before Him condemned and guilty for our sin. And all sinners face the righteous punishment of God. Much more uh, than being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. We have to be saved from wrath, God's wrath for sin. 
We were enemies, it says. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled. That means we needed to be put back into a right relationship. Our relationship with God is broken as a sinner. And it says, if we were reconciled, uh, reconciled by his death, we shall be saved by his life. So, all sinners fail any righteous position before God, and all sinners face the righteous punishment of God. Listen, you need to see salvation as more than an optional benefit. You know, we, we offer the good news, the gospel to people, and sometimes I think we offer it in such a way they, they see this as, oh, that would be a nice thing. You know, I'd like to have something like that, but I don't really need it, you know. It's like shopping in a store. There's a lot of stuff that I'd like to have, but I really don't need. But people need to see this not as just a, a mere option that's a, a benefit is somehow to them if they choose to have it. it. You need to see it as an absolute need, the absolute, absolute need that it is. Every one of us is in sin and under the wrath of God unless God saves us from that. And if we stay in our sin, we will perish in our sins. So recall your need for salvation. And then reflect on God's provision for salvation. God shows us in this passage again what He did to make salvation possible. As you look at these verses, verses 2 and 6 through 11, you see that God freely provided us with the Savior sinners. He graced us. In verse 2, by whom also, well let me back up to verse 1 to get the uh, who we're talking about. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom? So it, this by whom refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is this? This is God's provision. That is His grace. And He has freely provisioned or provided us with the Savior of sinners. Now, as you look at the, that whole concept, you see different aspects to this and that is first of all that the Son of God substituted in your place for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die peradventure some would if there's someone that gives them some sort of benefit they'll dare to die but God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now the Greek word is huper. And that means to do something in behalf of or instead of. And so what we see is that the Son of God suffered as a substitution in your place. Now, there's some questions concerning salvation here that are answered, and this one answers who? Jesus Christ. The Son of God. God the Son. He's the one who did this. Now, you also see that the Son of God showed God's, uh, excuse me, suffered your punishment. As you look at verses 9 through 11, you see that he died... And then he also shed his blood, much more thou being justified by his blood, for without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness, no remission of sins. And it's through his blood that we are cleansed. And you also see that it talks about death again. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death, of his son. Now, of course, the apostle here didn't go into all the details of spelling out what the 
particular death was. It was understood at this point. He'd already been talking about it. It was the death of the cross. And before he died on the cross, he was beaten and he was mocked. And before he actually passed away on the cross, died on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he suffered physically and emotionally and uh, if, in a sense spiritually because his father turned his back on him. It answers who in the first aspect as well as what he died in our place. And this answers what? He suffered and died in our place. So as we review the communion, we're thinking, we're reflecting on God's provisions of salvation, for salvation. And it was Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who suffered and died in our place. And then the Son of God showed God's purpose in verse 8. And this is answering the question, why? Why would God do such a thing? But God demonstrated His love toward us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, it wasn't anything in our account that merited it or did it is nothing that compelled the Lord to do it on our account. It's because of who God is. God is love and he demonstrates his love toward us. That's what motivated him. That's what drove him to do what he did to save us from our sins. It's all God's part. And that's the why. Now, you see, he freely provided grace to us with the Savior of sinners, but God freely pronounces the saved as justified. That means to be pardoned or forgiven. Justified from their sin. Therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God. Now, he talks later in these verses and says we were reconciled to God. You see, we were no longer at peace with God. There was a broken relationship. He says we were enemies of God. And we needed to be reconciled to God. And it was through the death of Jesus Christ and when we're saved from our sins by faith and we are graced with salvation and we stand by God's grace through faith and uh, we stand before God as justified and reconciled. Pardoned, forgiven, and put back into a right relationship with God. So reflect on the love of God for you. And trust Him and demonstrate your love for Him in return. Now, a lot would stop right there, but we need this next aspect as we reflect upon salvation, as we review salvation. It is true that we need salvation. It is true that God has provided the means of salvation, but salvation doesn't just come automatically. You need to retrace your certainty of salvation. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, we do have a responsibility on our part. It's not something that merits anything. But when we just in faith trust God to save us, we have to exercise faith. We have, what is faith? Well, faith, as the scripture uses it, is not just a mental assent 
I've talked to some people that, and tried to find out if they had been saved from their sins and, they, and they've used this terminology and it's bugged me for a long time. And they will say, I've always believed. Well, I've already got a problem. You couldn't always believe. Uh, you started out as a sinner blinded in your sin to the truth. But they keep coming back. And I've asked some of them, well, have you ever asked Jesus to save you from your sin and put your faith in Him? And they say, well, I've always believed. And they keep coming back to that. And, it, and just warning flags come up in my heart and mind and I'm thinking, I'm not sure they really understand it. And it's come to me as I struggled and prayed about it. God, how do you speak to people like this? And I think he started to give me an answer. And I think this is a problem that a lot of people have, especially in our religious America. And it comes to this difference in the idea of belief. What is belief? Oh, I can believe things with the head. And there are many who have grown up in religious backgrounds who believe what they have been taught by their religions. And they've always believed that. Their religious traditions, their religious doctrines, oh, I've always believed that. But have they ever put their full dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ to save them from their sin? And the answer to that is many times no. And that is the difference between a head acknowledgement and a heart acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. You need to ask Jesus to save you and put your faith in Him that He will. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So remember the circumstance or the event, the occurrence, the fact of your salvation. Have you indeed ever come to a place in your life where you've said to the Lord Jesus, save me from my sin, or I'm trusting you to be my Savior right now. I'm putting my faith in you. Or are you just sort of simply, I believe what my daddy said, or my church has said, or my religion has said. Is it all up here? Or have you really accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And then rejoice in the confidence of your salvation. If you have truly been saved, it provides hope and confidence We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The glory that we can share while we're here, but that future glory where we'll sh share eternity in His presence. Well, if that's not something to rejoice about, you've got a problem. I'll tell you this. I've said this many times. Oh, I'd love to have Rosalie come back for me uh, to have her love and her companionship, but I would never bring her back here. She's enjoying the very presence of God in glory. Why in the world would anybody want her to come back here? And I'm looking forward to being up there. And I have that confident hope. It's not a wishful thinking that the Word of God uses here. It is a confident expectation based upon the promises of God and the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has done in my behalf. It tells us that we're saved from His wrath. We have been reconciled says we're saved and we have joy. All of these words are used here. Rejoice in the confidence of your salvation. If you've been saved, you've got a lot to rejoice about. 
Listen, identify a time when you asked in faith Jesus to save you. And if you haven't done that, do it today. Do it now. In your heart, call out to Jesus and say, I'm a sinner that needs to be saved, and I know you're the one who died in my place and took my place, and my penalty for sin has been taken care of because of what you did. And I know if I put my faith in you and trust you to save me, you'll save me right now. I'm trusting. Save me, Lord Jesus. And if you can identify a time when you've done that, love, obey, and serve the one who has saved you. Ask him to help. It's good to review over and over again salvation. The why? Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, God's love. The who? Jesus Christ. And the what? His substitution and his suffering in your behalf. Review that so you treat the matter with sincerity, appreciation, and with the response it deserves. Tells us in the scriptures that after the Lord Jesus had this first uh, round of communion with his disciples that they sang a hymn and went out. Well, we're just a little past time. Uh, the song is, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For all, for thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee. My Jesus, tis now. Is that true? Is that your prayer? Is that your song to the Savior today? I hope that it is. And if you have one of those hymnals at home, I would ask you to take in 666 and go over those words. And may they become a worship song from your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you need to know Jesus as your Savior, you have questions, you, you need somebody or want somebody to walk through this with you, we'd be glad to do that. Come to us. Let us know you want to be saved. And uh, we'll open the Word of God with you. We'll pray with you. We'll try to answer your questions. Uh, if you're a believer and there's something that God's working on your heart and you'd like somebody to walk through that with you as well, we'd love to be here for you. So just come to us and let us know that you have that need.